welcome to a bonus episode of the Endless Knot podcast. A little while ago, the university that Mark and I work at, Thornalow University at Laurentian, held a forum on race and racism in scholarly pursuits. Mark and I both gave talks, brief 15-20 minute talks, about how race and racism uh, connected to our respective fields. And we recorded those talks, so we're going to present those to you now. They're basically unedited, and they were aimed at non-scholarly audiences, or at least audiences that weren't specialists in our field, so they should be fairly straightforward to uh, understand. They are both also, therefore, reasonably general discussions of the topics, not getting into too many specifics. We have the video for this, so uh, if you're listening to this on the YouTube channel, you'll see that we have video of both of us giving our talks. If you're listening to it on the podcast, but you'd like to see us standing in front of podiums and gesticulating, you can go to the YouTube channel Endless Not Podcasts for that. And otherwise, we hope you find these interesting. Thanks. Now, in Greek and Latin, there are in neither language particularly sort of one word that is equivalent to our word race. The words that are most often translated with the word race, if you look in the dictionary, are gens or genus or genos, in the, the, they're related in Latin and Greek, and phule or phule, the, um, which gives us phyla in English. Uh, those, the words basically relate to family, related by family, they're cognate with kin in English. So, you know, you can see how they mean race, and they are certainly used to mean peoples. The fact that there isn't an exact equivalent term to the word race, uh, race, the English word, doesn't come from an obviously classical prede uh, predecessor and comes in much later in, uh, into English. The fact that there wasn't a single exact term, though, doesn't mean that there weren't conceptions of race in the ancient world, that there weren't prejudices, hierarchies, stereotypes, but it should be a clue that the categories and the divisions between peoples could be quite different. This is not a static, the idea of race has not been a static thing over the period. So distinctions between people, to generalize extremely, distinctions between people in Greece and Rome tended to be made on the grounds of location, of the character of the peoples, of their language, their culture, their governmental type was a big deal, and only secondarily on various aspects of physical appearance. So these were certainly noted and noticed and, and mattered, but things like hair color, height, and skin color uh, tended not to be as important for distinguishing peoples as did they speak your language? Did they worship with the gods you worshiped in the same ways? How did they marry? That was a big deal. What were their sexual practices? Things like that. The basic prejudices were, both in the case of ancient Greece, and when I say Greece, I often mean Athens, though not always. That's a thing to do with our sources. Um, and in Rome, the basic prejudices were the more like us, whether Athens or Rome, they are in their political organization, language, and basic religious, sexual, and food customs, as well as clothing. The more like us they are, the better. The less like us, the worse. And there tended to be sort of a, it, it's not as simple as this, but they did tend to be a bit of, if they happened to live closer to us, often they were more like us and better. That doesn't hold as true, especially in the Roman world, because their geographic reach is much wider. But, you know, it was sort of a rough rule of thumb. It was also strongly influenced by historical encounters and particular occurrences. So for the Greeks, the soft, weak, cunning and overly luxurious Persians were their great other, the barbarian. That was their term for them. While for the Romans, the fierce, stupid, overly savage Germans and Gauls were their real barbarians. And that really comes out to a large extent of who they had a lot of battles with, who they fought, when, um, who lived near them. Now, Another sort of distinction from the way the race has worked and functioned in the more modern era is that pretty much every people in the Mediterranean, every group in the Mediterranean enslaved others to some extent. Uh, Athens and Rome are particularly talked about as slave societies, meaning that they have economies based on slavery. But leaving that aside for the moment, pretty much every group we know of in, in any way had some enslaved persons category, um, whether that was a small or large number. But 
they generally preferentially, most groups preferentially did not enslave their own group members. However, that group was just determined. So roughly Greeks didn't enslave Greeks, Romans didn't enslave Romans, though with Greeks, Maybe Athenians didn't enslave Athenians, Spartans didn't enslave Spartans, except when they did. So like, let's not, I don't want to over uh, exaggerate that. But there was a sort of preferential use of enslavement for outsiders, which did mean that there was a sort of rough um, element to which slaves did, enslaved people were tended to be foreign. But they came from, in both cases, they came from a, a multiplicity of different ethnicities, there was no homogeneity to who were being enslaved, meaning that there was not one type of person who was likely to be enslaved. Now, there were certain groups that were thought of as particularly good at particular jobs or particular kinds of labor. Uh, so there certainly were uh, groups who were more pro and who, if you were having a long series of wars with a group, then a lot of slaves would come from that region for a long period of time. So there could be... Um, uh, ethnic types that were considered to be enslaved, but it was not the same from time to time or place to place. All right. The other point there is that at Rome in particular, enslaved people could become free uh, with, uh, uh, there's a lot of arguments about the frequency with which that happened, but with enough frequency that since they became free and their children became full citizens, the ethnic makeup or the the people who made up the Roman world did change over time and the concept of Romanness quite quickly by the middle republic probably was much more of a political thing than it was uh, a particular uh, a look or a genetic or a physical characteristic it was a language you all spoke the same language because there was an assimilation process but in terms of what we would call race Romans were not one race that said, there did continue to be certain kinds of prejudices about sort of the, the upper class, the elite, the political class tended to be from the oldest families. They would be able to trace their lineage back further. So there would be some, there was some, there was definitely prejudice against people from the provinces or people from outside or people with slaves in their background. Absolutely. But um, even that tended to change um, and shift over time, especially with, you know, large members of the numbers of the people in the Senate being murdered in the uh, revolutions that and the, the civil wars before the empire began. So even that changed to some extent. And the concept of who was Roman was a constantly fluctuating idea. Now, so that's our picture of the ancient world. It should include race. The ancient world talked about different races of people all the time. But and it should probably include racism, though the intersection between prejudice and systemic structural uh, races, you know, power relations, varied a lot from different place to different place. And you really need to talk, I think, particularly there. You should talk, what was there racism in Athens? Was there racism in Rome in the first century BC? Like, you need to be more particular in order to address that issue. Um, my gut feeling is there was sort of some, some sorts of racism most of the time in most places, but how that, what that looked like is going to vary a lot. Crucially then, what I want to take from that is that the criteria for racial divisions were not the same then as they are today. There were racial divisions, they were not the same as they are now. So let's now turn to the modern world and to the role that the ancient world and importantly, the discipline of classics has played in the development of our contemporary experiences of race. Now in the 17th, and this is gonna really compress the whole history of race in Europe and North America <laughs> into, I think, a sentence. Um, <laughs> in the 17th to 19th centuries in Europe, especially in England, France, and Germany, elsewhere as well, as the idea of race was being recreated or created or reimagined for economic, political, religious purposes, as being based on physical characteristics centered on skin color, this is a process that is going on through the post-enlightenment period, uh, and whiteness was being constructed as a category in opposition to blackness or darkness, this is a process that is going on, as all of that is happening, Greco-Roman antiquity was being deployed to justify to the supremacy of whiteness, to say white was better, 
And at the same time, Greco-Roman antiquity was being itself redefined as being part of that white world. And this was a self-enforcing cycle, the sort of both halves played into each other. So first, as the Greco-Roman cultures and literature and language were elevated to the top of the intellectual period, a pyramid, as the most prestigious field of study, the highest aesthetic standard in the Renaissance and afterwards in that period, Western Europeans sought to position themselves as the direct and often exclusive inheritors of that tradition. We are the descendants of the Romans. We are the descendants of the Greeks. Not only did they do this in an intellectual and literary sense, but they also used, often entirely made up, uh, genealogical and linguistic connections to tie themselves to the Greeks, say the Greeks to the Germans or the Greeks to the English, as being the dis direct inheritors. This connection, and uh, not... You understand, I'm not saying there isn't any connection between these peoples, but the strengths of it and often the evidence being used were uh, suspect, shall we say. <laughs> the connection between the ancient Greeks and Romans and the modern French, German, English was then used to justify the superiority of those Europeans. Obviously, as the direct inheritors of the best culture ever, they were naturally best and to exclude any groups that could not tie themselves back to the Greco-Roman world. If you don't have ties to that world, you are naturally inferior. Though this often entailed overlooking or outright ignoring or falsifying evidence of the interconnected, wide-ranging Mediterranean, where there were a lot of connections between peoples and outside of the Mediterranean as well. So it's important to note at this point, that this is not just about misuse of classical material by non-specialists, by the world. This is being done by the people who are becoming the first classicists. The people who are founding classics as a discipline are engaged in this cultural process. Um, sometimes as a byproduct of what they're doing, sometimes as the deliberate and exclusive point of what they were doing. At the same time, moves were made to turn the ancient Greeks and Romans white. Though, interestingly, that same categorization didn't initially extend to modern Greeks and modern Italians who were not included in the white race in the same way until well into the 20th century. They weren't necessarily black, but they certainly weren't white, not like a ro an Englishman is white in early conceptions of race. One very important example of this came from the newly emerging field of classical archaeology. As more and more digs were taking place and more and more semi-scientific approaches to archaeology were going on, uh, more Greek and Roman statues had been emerging from the digs, and antiquarians were also searching out and buying and restoring those that had survived the centuries above ground. But the vast majority of surviving statues, as well as the ruins of ancient buildings, both Greek and Romans, the things that had survived were marble, because the bronzes and other metals had been melted down and reused, and anything organic like wood had, had perished over the uh, 2,000 years. So the image emerged of white marble statues set in a white marble classical world. People also scrubbed the, class the statues clean. They looked dirty, so they scrubbed them down uh, to restore them to their perfect purity and simplicity. Uh, and this aesthetic focus on whiteness as the pinnacle of beauty um, really reinforced the construction of white superiority, and it also created an image of the Greek and Roman world as being pure white, of these pure white, like white in a way that no human being has ever been white um, in the ancient world. And while no, none of these people were saying that's exactly what Romans looked like, it qualifies that as the sort of pinnacle of beauty. One very influential figure in this process was Johann jo Joachim, I can't do German, uh, Winkelmann, who died in 1768, tragically, in a murder in an inn, but anyway, we'll leave that aside. Uh, his, and I'm quoting here, two volumes on the history of ancient art were hugely popular in Europe and helped define art history as we know it today. They also perpetuated and further entrenched the idea that white marble statues like the famed Apollo of the Belvedere were the epitome of beauty. And I'm sorry, I don't have pictures. I should have, but I didn't, so imagine it. Um, the Apollo of Belvedere you've all seen. It's a very, very famous, even if you don't know you have, you've seen this. It's used in like 
um, clothing ads and things quite often, for instance. Uh, there's a fabulous article in Forbes by the scholar Sarah Bond that I'm drawing on here for the history of white statues that I really urge you to look up. It's really, she sets it all out really well. Now, what wasn't realized at the time, or if it was realized, it was ignored and rejected, remember that scrubbing, was that most, if not all, marble statues had once been painted. But the paint didn't survive, almost never in more than trace amounts, over the 2,000 years. So that this basic and sometimes willful misunderstanding that these statues had been colorful, that pure white was not the aesthetic pinnacle of civilization, but that in fact it was a colorful, multivarietal world, just like it's always been everywhere. But this, I, this, um, this misunderstanding has continued into the present day with alt-right sites and European nationalists proudly claiming the stat white statues of the ancient world, both as their inheritance and as proof of the continuity of the white race. Look, they were us, we are them, it is all the same. This, concept, uh, this conception of continuity, or even sameness, is not only incorrect because the statues weren't white, but also because both the Greeks and the original Romans, whatever that means, the Romans in the earliest periods, saw themselves as very definitely distinct, not only from Easterners and Africans, but also from Gauls and Germans and Celts, who were clearly marked in all ethnographic texts as sharply distinguished from normal. Normal was not the Germans and the Gauls, and those peoples in, who so later on wanted to call themselves dis, you know, descended from the uh, Roman world, they were very much other for both the Germans and the Greeks, uh, sorry, for both the Romans and the Greeks. Uh, they were marked in all ethnographic texts as distinguished from normal by their wearing of pants, their drinking of milk, completely ridiculous things to do, uh, fighting naked, by their tallness, by their red hair, by their very white skin, and many other aspects. They were not considered the same as Greeks and Romans. There is no way that either Greeks or Italian Romans could have conceived of a racial category that encompassed them and Northern or Western Europeans while excluding Persians and Africans. That concept of that grouping is firmly modern. So the point here is not to determine whether the ancient Greeks or Romans were really white, i.e. what color their skin was. Since race doesn't have a genetic validity, you can't make a genetic marker. There is no, there is no hard and fast edge to where whiteness stops and starts from a genetic point of view. And anyway, white people today hardly have homogenous skin tones. Not everybody looks the same. What's important is that the entire category of white, with everything that that means today, and it means an awful lot, has been constructed out of a no number of economic, political, and historical circumstances, many of them based on misconceptions, if I want to be kind about it. And it is not in any way a natural or objective one. This is not a category that re reaches back into infinity as a set, stable state. And it's not a category that would be understandable to a Greek or a Roman. They would just not know what you meant by it. And the field and the discipline of classics has been part of this construction from the beginning. Meaning, in my opinion, that everyone who teaches or studies the field now has a duty to be part of the deconstruction of that category and of its social and political and economic consequences. Thank you. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, an issue that's going on right now uh, in the world of medieval scholarship, particularly uh, in the world of scholarship on um, the early medieval period in England, what has traditionally been called the Anglo-Saxon period. Um, and it all started with basically calls for the name of a professional society, uh, ISAS, which stands for the International Society of Anglo-Saxonists, uh, on the basis that the term Anglo-Saxonist is racist and is very much used by white supremacists. 
Uh, and in particular, it was triggered by the resignation of Dr. Mary Rambaran Ohm from the position of second vice president of the society in, in kind of protest to uh, the uh, dragging of heels on this issue. Um, <clears throat> Now, there has uh, since been a backlash from scholars in the field uh, who don't want to give up the name Anglo-Saxon. Um, and this kind of has grown beyond the, uh, the particular instance of one uh, professional society to include, you know, what do we call the field? Do we call ourselves, you know, Anglo-Saxonists? Do we uh, say that we are studying Anglo -Saxon, the Anglo-Saxon period or whatnot? And a lot of this sort of backlash against the calls to change the name, um, uh, which has uh, been carried out on, uh, in online uh, places, on social medias, in blogs, and so forth, as well as presumably um, in personal uh, discussions as well. Uh, so these backlash, th this backlash has included uh, a lot of crude racist and sexist terms of abuse. Um, uh, including from academics. Like, I'm not saying this is just the sort of, you know, Odinists on the fringes, but including Anglo-Saxonists, Anglo-Saxonists themselves, scholars themselves. There's also been uh, even threats of physical violence. I don't think any of those have come from any academics, but uh, I couldn't swear to it. And so uh, there have been, therefore, counter arguments against these, you know, the arguments that have been uh, marshaled uh, to defend the name uh, Anglo-Saxon. So given the time I have today, I'm not going to try and recap all of the excellent points that uh, my colleagues have made uh, in social media and so forth, uh, various articles, um, about this. Uh, but what I instead tend to do is focus on a few linguistic points uh, about the term Anglo-Saxon, where it came from, and what it meant. Um, in particular, what I'm going to try to do is answer four questions today. Uh, was Anglo-Saxon a word to describe the people at the time? Uh, why did it come to be used to describe a unified culture? How pervasive is or was uh, the term uh, as a racial term? And is reclamation of the term desirable or even possible? Uh, also, uh, instead of trying to counter all of the uh, kind of problematic and uh, potentially racist arguments uh, used in favor of the term, I'm going to respond in particular to one document. Uh, so there was a, a, a new forum that popped up in the sort of wake of the collapse of the society. Uh, it's called a Forum for Multidisciplinary Anglo-Saxon Studies, which, as they say on their website, was... Um, uh, which they say on their website was uh, uh, created to help fill the void that was created, end quote. And uh, they put out this document called, quote, the responsible use of the term Anglo-Saxon, which they state is, quote, on the responsible use of the now controversial term Anglo-Saxon, which has been carefully discussed by some 60 active and experienced scholars in the field, end quote. And it includes quite a number of very prominent scholars as signatories on this. Uh, and I will focus on this document because it's pretty representative of the sorts of arguments that have been marshaled uh, for this term. First of all, I want to point out that no one is calling for the absolute ban of the term Anglo-Saxon. Uh, you know, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle will still be called the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Uh, you know, there are many publications that have uh, the term Anglo-Saxon in it. Obviously, we're going to have to keep using that. Uh, all that's being uh, requested here is that we stop identifying ourselves as Anglo-Saxon, identifying our professional societies as Anglo-Saxon, and so forth. So, was Anglo-Saxon a word to describe the people at the time? Uh, the claim that they make is, uh, quote, historically, uh, that it's the, the term is historically authentic in the sense that from the 8th century, it was used externally to refer to a dominant population in southern Britain and came into regular use within England, England itself from the 9th century onwards. And, furthermore, they make the claim that Anglo-Saxon is, quote, precise and concise, unmarked reference. Okay, they're using the term unmarked here, so let's 
uh, unpack what that really means. Uh, markedness is a linguistic concept that refers to uh, a form or usage that stands out as divergent from the regular or more common form. So we see this in verb tenses, right? Walk, present tense, is unmarked. Walked, past tense, is marked, right? Um, favorable is unmarked, whereas the sort of negative, sorry, favorable is, is unmarked, yeah, that's the, uh, uh, that's the, the normal form, whereas unfavorable, the negative form, is the marked form, right? And so even with pairs like old and young, old is unmarked because you would never ask someone how young they are, you always ask them how old they are, so it's the normative form. Uh, and this is even used, of course, in, uh, in cases of gender, right? Host is unmarked, hostess is unmarked, and some would even, uh, at least historically, have argued that man is unmarked and woman is marked, uh, especially in phrases like mankind, right? Well, uh, I challenge the notion that Anglo-Saxon is an unmarked term on that basis. First of all, there was never a cohesive homogeneous group called the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, they never completely replaced the Celtic peoples that were there. They were made up of multiple different tribes uh, that, for most of the, the history of that period, would they would have associated themselves with more local names, the Saxons, uh, the Mercians, uh, the Kentish, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so the name Anglo-Saxon... Uh, comes from uh, a, a collection of Germanic tribes that invaded or migrated uh, or settled in, depending on how you read the history, uh, in the fifth century in the wake of the fall of Roman Britain, um, leaving the Britons to defend, uh, to defend themselves. There were in fact more tribes than just the Angles and the Saxons. The Jutes were certainly a prominent uh, group that came over during that time. And there were probably some others as well, like the Frankish, uh, and the Frisians and, and uh, so forth. Um, the other point to make is that even though it borrows two of these groups, Angles and Saxons, um, it is not what we would call an endonym. An endonym is a name that a population, a group, or whatever kind calls themselves. It began as an exonym. So we first see it recorded by uh, writers on the continent, particularly in Italy. Uh, Paul the Deacon was the first to, that we first record that we have it being used. Uh, he's writing in what is today Italy. Um, and basically it didn't really, it wasn't really a compound word, a hyphenated compound word, the, the way that we think of it today. It's actually a noun and a modifier. So it was originally, it really meant something like the English Saxons, as opposed to the regular Saxons who lived on the continent. So it's therefore very much a marked term. There's the regular Saxons and there are the English Saxons. So it's an exonym. It's being used in Latin, not in English, but in Latin writings by people who weren't uh, the people living there themselves. It eventually gets picked up in uh, local sources, uh, in, in, in uh, texts that were written in England, uh, though mainly in Latin, not so much in Old English. Uh, and even there, it was used only in certain circumstances and not very widely. So it was picked up particularly uh, in kind of royal propaganda or royal charters, that sort of thing, to create a sense of a unified people, which they weren't at the time. This is when King Alfred is trying to unify the parts of the country that are at least not, that have not fallen to uh, Viking attack. So it's serving a political purpose, and it's never very widely used. They did have uh, endonyms being used, um, in addition to the sort of more local names like Saxons and uh, Kentish and so forth. Uh, they would often call themselves simply the English. Uh, basically sounds the same as the modern word today, or other terms like Anglekin and Anglefolk. Um, and so... It's really only at, you know, when we get the uh, imposition of supremacy by the West Saxon royal line over the entire nation, which certainly in the North, they resisted this all throughout the, uh, the so-called Anglo-Saxon period. Uh, nevertheless, they borrowed this term, uh, this ex exonym, to be used for this kind of royal supremacy, the you know, king of the Anglo-Saxons. But it never caught on with 
the average person. It was really only used in that kind of context. Now, <clears throat> so, so in early medieval England, then Anglo-Saxon was an exonym. Uh, it was not adopted by the English themselves, at least until later, and was a marked form only used for certain specific contexts. Now, the next question, why did it later come to be used to uh, describe a unified culture? Well, after the Norman Conquest in 1066, the term Anglo-Saxon actually pretty much disappeared, it died out. Uh, and it was only resurrected in the 16th century to distinguish between pre-conquest England and uh, everything that came after. So again, it's kind of marked, right? It's the Anglo-Saxon and then all the rest of the English periods. Um, Furthermore, uh, the, this interest in pre-conquest England began in the 1530s to provide propaganda to justify Henry VIII's break with Rome. The idea was if they could show the sort of historical continuity of the English church, uh, this was justification for the church in England to be separate from Rome. And so it, again, the term was used as kind of propaganda. Um, particularly all of this was driven by Matthew Parker spawning an interest in the study of Old English materials. Uh, but once you get into the 17th century, we have uh, antiquarians such as Richard uh, Ver uh, Verstigan and William Camden, who continued this kind of antiquarian interest in uh, Old English, celebrating the virtues of the Anglo-Saxons and their institutions, such as the church and the laws. And so it starts to broaden out and in fact, the OED lists Camden as the reviver of the term Anglo-Saxon. Uh, we also see a particular interest in uh, the Anglo-Saxon materials in the growing United States, particularly Thomas Jefferson held the Anglo-Saxons in very high regard uh, and specifically celebrated their institutions, their laws, and so forth. So again, the term Anglo-Saxon then is being used to show the supremacy of a group, not necessarily yet on the basis of race, uh, but for a variety of other reasons, better church, better laws, better institutions and customs, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> in 1787, the antiquarian John Pinkerton, in his dissertation on the origin of the Scythians and or Goths, arguing for Germanic racial supremacy, stating that the Celts were an inferior people who had been driven out of Europe by the Goths, which is a term he uses very loosely, but includes Germanic people, but not exclusively. Um, uh, but he, he used, uh, he was arguing for a specific racial superiority by that point. So we're talking towards the end of the 18th century here. So the origins and revival, uh, uh, the origins of the revival of this term lie in propaganda, uh, politicization at the very least, and at the worst, outright racism. So that's the second question. The third question, how pervasive is or was the use uh, of Anglo-Saxon as a racial term? Again, the claim is made, quote, um, appropriation that uh, they complain about the appropriation and misuse and misrepresentation of a historical concept, right? And so they're saying that this term is being, uh, you know, improperly used by some fringe people, uh, but it has a true proper historical reference. Well, as we've seen, it never really was a historical concept outside of propaganda use. Um, and they also complain that a lot of uh, the problem lies in the United States and the, the implications of the word Anglo-Saxon in the United States. So what I have here is uh, collocations. These are the top 10 collocations uh, with the word Anglo-Saxon. Um, and as you can see, uh, so this is for all of English globally, as you can see, Anglo-Saxon England currently is at the top, but that's only fairly recently in the past 40 years, uh, but the big winner here uh, th throughout the 19th century is Anglo-Saxon race. It has historically generally been uh, a, uh, oops, that's the wrong one, there we go, sorry. It's historically generally been a con used as a racial or racialized term. <clears throat> 
And if we kind of fine tune this a bit, uh, so this is uh, the use in American English. Again, we see Anglo-Saxon race not only currently at the top, or at least top, basically in, tied with the top, a top spot with Anglo-Saxon England, but it's also the top, uh, by far the, uh, the most common uh, collocation in the 19th century. If we look again at specifically British English, well now Anglo-Saxon England is the, uh, our top result here. Anglo-Saxon England is our, is our highest result now, though in recent years uh, we see a steep decline. This data only goes up to 2008, by the way, because uh, the Google Books uh, data doesn't go beyond that point. So we can imagine this might uh, be even uh, more uh, in decline now. Race, Anglo-Saxon race, is you know uh, quite a ways further down in, in uh, in current usage, though growing slightly. But again, in the 19th century, though it's not as dramatic, it was basically at the top or near the top. So uh, basically then what this suggests is that uh, the term has always been associated with race. Uh, and uh, this is not a new phenomenon. This is not you know, misappropriation by uh, some fringe groups. And finally, the question, is reclamation of the term desirable or even possible? The claim is, uh, it is an honorable and valid position to defend and insist upon a historically and interpretively correct use of the term and to reclaim uh, misinterpreted features of the early Middle Ages where necessary rather than abandoning them. Now, as we've already seen, Anglo-Saxon is not a historically and interpretively correct use. Uh, it's a marked term throughout its history. Uh, how, uh, and anyways, this is a bit of a misunderstanding of how linguistic reclamation or reappropriation works. Usually it refers to an external slur that's being used to uh, disparage a particular group being adopted by the group that's being disparaged. Uh, in this case, that's not, that doesn't hold, right? This is a, a term that was originally being applied from outside, but is currently being used by the group to make themselves, to build themselves up, not to disparage uh, other groups directly. What it does uh, suggest, however, is that anyone who isn't Anglo-Saxon is somehow lesser, right? So uh, there's no mechanism, therefore, to reclaim the term, there's no way, for instance, to stop, uh, you know, white supremacists from using the term. Um, the only way to make Anglo-Saxon lose its power is uh, its power to uh, disparage others is to distance ourselves from the term. And in any case, in terms of the U.S.-Britain split. Uh, this is bad branding, right? Uh, if a company marketed a product that was with a name that was fine in one market but was highly offensive in another market, well, that's a big problem. So, and it leaves aside the uh, reality of uh, the power of language to frame how we perceive reality. So again, there is the claim that it can also be held in good conscience that it is a damaging misdirection of attention to target a word rather than the actual realities that need to be tackled. But again, uh, this is a linguistic falsehood. Linguists have demonstrated quite clearly the power of words uh, uh, to frame how we perceive reality, as I say. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, to conclude, uh, we have to ask ourselves the question, why are people reacting so strongly against a terminology, a change in terminology? Uh, if it were simply a matter that Anglo-Saxon was uh, less, quote, ambiguous, as they say, less verbose and less clumsy, uh, why would there have been such vehement backlash, right? If it's just infelicitous, the normal reaction would simply be, well, okay, whatever. But instead, people are reacting quite violently. And so, to sum up, almost uh, the term has almost always had a connotation of elitism, superiority, uh, whether that's political, institutional, cultural, or racial. Uh, and there is no linguistic argument to keep it, I would argue. And that is...
Mark would like to point out that we are standing in front of lecterns, not podiums. No, I wouldn't. That was a joke. I don't care. <laughs> okay, I'll leave it. I won't, like, I won't say anything. I won't put that back in. <laughs>